got uh, we got Jordan and we got Chris. Um, Jordan is a United States Air Force veteran, so let's give it up for Jordan and here to all the veterans in our community. Um, he has an interesting story of how he ended up into tech, and we'll un unpack it uh, more on the call. But he's not just joining by himself. He's also joining um, today with Chris, who is um, he's one of the most senior engineers at Twitter. And the reason both of them are joining is they're eager to help you folks understand what do software engineers do? Why should people be excited about these jobs? besides just uh, getting paid. I think, everyone, I think everyone wants to take care of their families. Everyone wants to provide for their families and have that uh, financial security. But besides that, there's a lot of other advantages in the working into tech. So that's, that's, those are the main reasons why we have Chris and we have Jordan on here. Um, and so without further ado, we're gonna do a quick, um, we're gonna let Jordan and Chris introduce themselves and then we'll jump into uh, Q and A. Uh, so Jordan, Chris, welcome to uh, welcome to Career Karma. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I'll go first because I kind of want to give uh, Chris the introduction because uh, Chris mm -hmm. is a pretty special person in my story. So, uh, so Chris was actually the first engineer I ever met. Like I think I had been coding for like maybe a month or two when I first met him. So he's always uh, been like that special person in my tech uh, journey. So, um, so intro for how I got into tech. So. When I was in the Air Force, I didn't really like it. Like I just, just kind of like just going through the flow, just letting the Air Force take me wherever they wanted to. Uh, so eventually, like I just was like, you know, this is not what I want to do like for the rest of my life. So I got on Free Code Camp, uh, started just going through Free Code Camp, and uh, like I was just going like hard on it. Maybe like at least like I don't know, four hours a day, maybe sometimes uh, more if I could. Um, so um, doing Free Code Camp on an Air Force base. And one of the pilots that I met on the Air Force Base, this is where, if you've seen it, they said I, I got into Twitter through the back door. This is like where that part comes in. Um, so I met like one of the pilots on the Air Force Base and we were like just chatting about tech and he was just like, oh, I know someone that works at Twitter. And um, like literally like that one conversation is like, what was the like the spark that got me into Twitter? And I was like, oh, can you introduce me to this person? And it's my daughter coming in. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm like, can you introduce me to this person? And so like he makes the intro. He makes the intro, and then uh, I, I meet her. Her name is Treyer, and uh, eventually, like over the next like twelve months, like we become like really good friends, and she's mentoring me. Jordy, stop doing that. And uh, <laughs> and so it, it was just awesome. So like we just formed like a bond, and the whole time I'm like learning how to code and stuff. I'm just like telling her like you know like I would love to come work at Twitter, and uh, you know just kind of grinding and stuff. And so. Uh, by the time I was like nearing the end of my uh, Air Force enlistment, um, she had just said that she had created like this like special opportunity for me to come intern at Twitter. Because um, usually you can't intern at Twitter if you're not like a university grad. So that was like the back door right there. I came in as an intern and then I just converted to full time after uh, six months. So uh, it was a really crazy story. Uh, I wouldn't say back door, but I thought, I thought that was kind of funny whoever put that on there. Um, so yeah. And then, so I met, Chris was the first engineer I ever met, and he also ended up being one of the people that interviewed me when I came to the intern. So it was like really cool. So I was like, oh, what's up? How's the kids and all that? So it was like a lot of bonds that I made along the way, like uh, to make like that story possible. So that's like my story in a nutshell. Yeah, so, uh, and that's a, that's a very, thanks a lot for sharing, Jordan, and thanks for serving our country. And uh, I think it's a unique, um, Story too, because you have Chris, who was one of the first people that you met uh, when you were entering into into tech, and he Chris is also on the call today. And Chris has his own unique story of how he ended up at Twitter. Um, he can also provide some insight on what it was like meeting Jordan, and like why did they, uh, why did Twitter decide to give Jordan um, that internship or that apprenticeship uh, when Jordan was leaving the Air Force? But Chris, are you on here? Do you mind just introducing yourself to our community? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, my name is Chris, uh, Chris Coco. I've been an um, engineer, uh, been working for a very long time. I'm almost sad to say how long, but it's been uh, 20 years. This is my 20th year of being an engineer programmer. Um, I've been nice. on Twitter for about uh, six and a half, almost seven years now um, at Twitter. 
And uh, like Jordan said, I met Jordan. He came through on a uh, military tour that Trier had organized. Trier was in the Air Force. She was a university recruiter here at Twitter. Um, she was doing a lot of stuff with vets groups. She brought in a group from the Air Force Base with Travis. Jordan was one of those folks. Um, I had lunch with him, sat down next to Jordan, and he just uh, talked my ear off about um, programming, wanted to be a programmer. We were chatting. I gave him a bunch of resources. Um, I'm like, you know, when you, when you, when you want to start looking at this for real, here's the things you should start looking into. Um, fast forward a year, um, he came back again with another veterans group. Um, he had taken everything that I said to do, and he had looked into every single thing. And then was talking my ear off again about all the different resources I gave him, and he had progressed in like his own knowledge um, from the year. And I was like, man, this, guy, this kid's serious. And um, and then Trier reached out to me sometime after that, saying that hey, Jordan was getting um, discharged from the military. He was looking for an internship. Would my team be willing to mentor and host him? And I said, sure, um, let's do it. Um, so my team interviewed him. I was one of the people who interviewed him. He passed the interview. Um, completely on his own, um, you know, with, with, with his own sort of fortitude, got the internship, you know, he likes to say he came through the back door, but he went through the same rigors that we put everybody else through. Um, and he was able to, to pass those rigors. He went through the interview, the internship process, which was not easy. It was two internships back to back. It's, um, two 12 week programs. Um, and so he, he learned a lot through that. He um, progressed through that, did enough in my team, and then went on to the next interview or the next internship and was offered a full-time position on that team since my team didn't have any spots and has been at Twitter ever since. And like, that, is, that is really all Jordan's work, and it's all his hard work um, and the effort that he put in and into doing that. So, yeah, he likes to say it's random chance, but he made his own luck, uh, and he worked hard to do. Yeah, Chris, thank you so much for uh... – for this introduction. Ruben, do you want to jump in? Yeah, man. Um, I, I, I'm just really excited to see this journey because I remember Jordan reached out to me before before that military tour, before a lot of things, through Twitter, actually, um, through a Twitter DM, like a lot of other people here um, are, are leveraging Twitter. M matter of fact, how many people on the call use Twitter before being on CareerCom on a day-to-day -day basis? Me. Yeah. How many people did it? I did. I did. I did. Oh. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 And so now, like, people are are leveraging their voice, and it's just awesome to see that, like, Jordan and Chris are leading things. We got a twenty-year vet here. A lot of people would say that you know the number of people on this call that come from all these different backgrounds um, don't don't exist in technology. Um, but this is just the beginning of a, of a very powerful movement. So I'm just, I'm just excited about that. Something that we haven't covered on a lot of these calls is how um, an engineering interview goes once you're done with a boot camp and you're looking for a job or if you're done with self taught and you're looking for a job. So I think it'd be awesome to talk through um, what the interview process was like from Jordan's perspective and also, um, Chris, how you conduct interviews and what traits you look for in people. Um, for entry level positions. Uh, cool. So I'll go first. So um, going back to like my interview, um, it was pretty, it was pretty nerve wracking. But uh, one thing that was different about my interview is that when I uh, got out the Air Force, uh, I only had I had one job interview. Like most people like uh, go through a lot, but I literally had all my eggs in one basket, which is usually frowned upon, but it worked out this time. <laughs> so mine was kind of like extra nerve wracking just because of that. But um. I think it was like you did I think four different interviews it was three technical and one behavioral and they're all like an hour a piece and uh and you're doing it on a whiteboard like the it's like two people that are interviewing you at once and like one's asking a question and the other is like kind of just like monitoring and pitching in when they can and they ask you a question and you saw it on the whiteboard and I do remember one of the uh one of the sessions like I couldn't solve the problem and like they like kind of gave me like a simpler like version of the problem and I was like oh okay like I saw this one but uh, I remember like after that one I was like I'm done like I couldn't solve the problem they gave me like I was like um I actually remember uh after I did my interview with Chris he was just like oh your next one's gonna be a lot harder and I was just like I just thought he was like playing around and then they gave me that problem and I was like I was in there like sweating like oh my god he wasn't playing but uh yeah so so that's how it is it's just like uh if anyone has ever been on like uh, what is it called, like Hacker Rank, or anything like that, or on Free Code Camp, how they make you solve algorithms. It's almost like exactly like that, except it's a person giving you the problem 
and you have to solve it on the whiteboard, which is a little bit different because you can't get like that instant feedback, like of running the code and seeing like what's slightly off. Like I remember one of my problems, like I was doing my interview, um, it was almost right, but I wasn't incrementing a for loop right. And it's like, if you would have ran that on a, on a computer, like you would have instantly known like, oh, I'm not incrementing, but like on a whiteboard, it's like just kind of flat and you had to wait until you see your mistakes. So, uh, so I would say, even though it's only four hours of interviews, it is kind of like, I'm not gonna say it's just like easy, but it's, it is like a lot of mental work, um, like staying sharp on all your skills and solving the problems. But, um, but it, it's definitely doable though. Like it's not like something crazy that no one could do. So that was my experience. And then it's not over. Even if you don't get one problem right, there's still like a lot more factors that go into deciding if you're like a good engineer which uh, is like communication skills and like your knowledge about uh, stuff. So it's not just like, hey, like pass or fail, like he didn't get the question, he's not gonna make it. So uh, that's something I really wanna, uh, want everyone to take in too. But uh, I hand it over to Chris, cause he actually does a lot of interviews and probably has a lot more good tips on how you could actually pass them. Unfortunately, um, coding interviews are usually not uh, very natural because of the fact that people do tend to do uh, whiteboarding um, as a as a feedback, and so um, you have to unfortunately deal with that because it's no we don't we don't code on a whiteboard normally, and so uh, writing on a whiteboard to to pass an interview is is a somewhat unnatural act. And I always try to keep that in mind when I'm interviewing people that it's that you're doing you're asking them to do something that you don't normally do. Um, here at Twitter, we try to structure our interviews uh, for engineers especially into sort of three things that Jordan mentioned. We do two technical interviews where we uh, ask you a problem, ask you to walk through it, and then we do a sort of one behavioral interview called top grading where someone talks to you and um, sort of just uh, gets a, a sense of your personality. Um, what we try to do is we try to make sure that we um, grade people on an objective criteria. And so when you are looking at um, a problem and we are asking you to solve a problem, we make sure that we have already uh, figured out a rubric to that problem and we just sort of judge you based on how close you came to that rubric. Um, this is to reduce bias in the interview process. We don't want people to be uh, subjective when grading an interview. Uh, we want them to be objective or as close to objective as possible um, so that we're not introducing any sort of bias into this mechanism. Um, as Jordan pointed out, uh, you know, we asked him a question, we asked him to walk through on the whiteboard. Again, um, one of the things that I try to keep in mind is that it's not a natural thing to do. And so I try to give people a lot of benefit of the doubt. As Jordan's pointing out, he had to write a for loop. You write that on a, a laptop, you're probably going to see the syntax right away. You're probably going to have an IDE or an editor to help you. Um, you won't get that necessarily in a whiteboard. You got to bring that stuff from your brain. And so there's a lot more leeway that is given when you're like, okay, yeah, you can write it out. You don't have to be syntactically correct. We're trying to judge. Um, do you get the gist of the problem? What direction are you going? And as Jordan is pointing out, other things are how well do you communicate? You know, the interview is really a process for showing um, how you think through something, but how well you also communicate you, yourself th thinking through that problem. Can you uh, relay your thoughts to your coworker? Um, and unless you're working by yourself, you're really gonna always be working in a group or a team with people and being able to relay um, your thoughts on a problem and how you're approaching something is, is a very useful skill. And that's one of the things we're looking for in an interview. interview. Even if you don't get the, the, the solution or the answer to the question, it's um, were you able to ad adequately think through or describe your thought process around the problem? You know, were you able to say, this is what I would do, I'm not sure how to do it, but here's what I would think, or here's how I think about it, and here's how I would uh, approach that, even though I don't know how to write those words out in this language or, or whatnot. Um, and one of the things specifically, Ruben, you asked about is, um, what do I look for when interviewing somebody? It sort of depends on the level um, to sort of guide the expectations. If I'm interviewing a person who, are, who is coming in for an internship or a junior level position, I don't expect them to have all the answers. Um, you don't necessarily have the experience. Um, you don't necessarily um, uh, know all the things. You haven't seen a lot of stuff before, so I'm always looking for, I really over-index on how you think about stuff. Um, I don't expect you to get to a solution necessarily. I just want to see um, how far you're going to get and how much you progress and how much you communicate and how well you communicate uh, what you're thinking about. And uh, if you get to an answer, great. If you don't, it doesn't matter. It's really the journey. And I, I'm interested in that journey when I'm interviewing you. Um, if you're more senior, uh, there comes with more expectations. You've seen a lot more things. You potentially worked through a lot more different things. 
Um, there's a sort of different rubric for people who have been in the industry for a little longer, and we sort of judge them by, okay, you probably should get to a solution if you have this amount of experience or if you've seen this stuff before, and go further into, um, into more advanced topics on, on interviews. Um, someone asked if, if Twitter does system design questions. It, it sort of varies depending on the group and the team. Um, most teams will do some type of system design um, as one of the technical things. And that could be an architecture, just design some boxes on the, on, the, on the board, talk through sort of problems, talk through how you get around things. And some other things are actual real code, write out the code um, and describe how it works and you know, run, run through test cases and things like that. So. Yeah, and I want to awesome. uh, thanks thanks a lot, uh, Chris, for sharing that and Jordan. Uh, I also want to emphasize. I know some of the community members who are joining in, they actually might be hearing about coding or coding interviews for the first time. So I also just want to emphasize that um, there's definitely like a methodology and a process to to doing and passing coding interviews. Um, the first time you do it, you may not necessarily get all the answers right, but doing, getting better at coding interviews, it's just like learning a skill, it's just like practicing a sport. There's definitely a methodology, a process, there's certain types of questions that you get asked, and after you, get a lot, after you practice a few of those types of questions, you start seeing the patterns, and that, that what helps you and positions you to get better at it. I think, um, Chris, since you've been at Twitter, you mentioned for seven plus years, um, you probably have seen the company grow. And what amazes me a lot of the time when people join Career Comma is a lot of people may not even realize the scale of how big Twitter is and how big your engineering team is. And um, maybe for the people on the call, do you mind kind of giving like an overview of like how big is Twitter's engineering team and what types of products and things that engineers do uh, at Twitter? So before, before doing that, people guess, people guess how many engineers are at Twitter first. Yeah. Let's see your guesses. That's funny. We literally just talked about this yesterday and we uh, had our weekly meeting. <laughs> As I said, Twitter's a big company. He's like, no, it's not. <laughs> So some some people said twenty five. Some people said um, twenty ninety thousand. Some people said uh, one hundred eighteen thousand. So someone said five, five to ten. Um, I, I say seventy five thousand. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> we, we, had call, we, we had a call. We had a call. SAP that has that had thirty thousand engineers. So. <laughs> Oh, no, so uh, so the, the official answer is that Twitter, the company, the whole company, is about 4,000 people. And wow. a little bit less than half of that is engineering. So a little less than 2,000 people are engineering. That's a lot of engineers. Um, Twitter, compared, comparatively to other companies, Twitter is really small. Twitter is not nearly as large as Facebook in terms of people, and it's not anywhere near Google size in terms of people. Uh, yeah. We do a lot of stuff with a little with a little amount of uh, people, and uh, it's it's actually a, a great company to work at because of that. Was, this is what I was talking to Jordan about: is that you can have a huge amount of impact, like the uh, the recognition and the, the the name is out there, and it's like the outsized brand impact we have for the amount of people we have is is kind of crazy. Um, yeah. It's one of the reasons I enjoy being here. One of the reasons I've been here for a while is that um, you can have a huge amount of impact on the world. Uh, when such a small company, yeah, and it kind of ripples through. Given that you spend such so much of your time hiring, um, and you all have this Blackbirds initiative and all these different things, and, and recruiting is a big, big focus. How do you all think about recruiting? Um, you know, what, what, like, how, what outreach efforts do you all have in regards to to that? Um, and whenever these people are finishing their programs and then the job search, like, what are the best ways to engage with Twitter? Um, whether it's not going through the website? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, so honestly, recruiting is, is challenging and making sure that we're uh, looking where people are is, is, is actually a, a big challenge. Recruiting sort of breaks down into two main places. There's university recruiting and then there's industry. And that's really it. And that's a problem because there's, there's a huge gap there. There's people who are not in university and not yet in industry and we don't see them. And um, I think recruiting is, we've talked to them about it before, and we, we're trying to push our industry recruiters um, into looking into 
different places and partnering with different organizations like Rear Karma and places like that who can bring other people to the workforce. But it's um, it's going to take the, having that relationship with recruiting. So I like to say that recruiting is kind of a race to the bottom. Um, so a recruiter's job is to get people in the door, right? Um, they're going to try to get as many people in the door as possible because they get judged on how many people get hired. And so they're going to get people in the door who they think are going to get hired. And so they're not actually trying to find great candidates from different places. They're trying to find people to get in the door. It's up to us as hiring managers and the people who are doing hiring to push recruiting to get outside of their comfort zone and to get outside of their area and say, no, we want people who are from different places who have that hunger, who have that desire, who don't necessarily come in from university, who don't come in from industry, but are coming from different places. So um, I don't have a great answer for how um, you get in the door right now. Um, if you don't come in through one of those other places, um, one of the things that we definitely do is that we go to a lot of conferences, we go to a lot of uh, trade or uh, trade meetups and things like that. Um, going to places where you can get in front of companies, going to meetups, going to conferences where companies are going to be and where they're trying to find people to hire is probably one of the best things to do, especially if they're if you're in the Bay Area. There's a lot of things happening, a lot of local meetups, a lot of local conferences, a lot of um, uh, tech events where companies go and there are recruiting presence because companies are always looking for people. Um, that's one of the best ways to get in, barring a like a relationship with a group that has a relationship with recruiting in a, in a company. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Can I ask one more question before opening it up for questions to everybody? Um, Jordan, if you can share the, the difference between life as a veteran uh, versus life on a day-to-day -day basis as a software engineer. Um, and uh, let us know if you like the difference uh, or not. And then Chris, kind of like your transition from a junior engineer to senior engineer, like how you navigated that. Uh, I don't know if we have enough time for me to uh, make all of those comparisons, but I'll try. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, being like a, being in the military, so I always have to write a book about like how different it was being in the military, uh, but um, I mean, just off top, like a lot of like the benefits that you get, like uh, being like, I don't know if it's just in tech, but just being an engineer versus the military is a lot. So uh, something I always bring up is things like paternity leave. Like when I was in the military, I had my daughter and I got 10 days off, like my daughter for a newborn baby. And I was just like, what? And then like, I go and talk to uh, like Chris at Twitter and he's like, yeah, we get like five months off pay. And I'm like, what? Like five months, like half a year. Like you had 10 kids, you don't have to work like 20, like 10 years. So you had 10 kids, but <laughs> so it's like, you still, you still get paid for 20 years. Though. It's like, so it's just like, that's like one thing. So 10 days paid and then five months for a newborn baby. So uh, yeah, Chris actually, we, we both had our daughters at the same time. So I got my 10 days while Chris was over there getting his five months, you know? So uh, like, that's one big change. Uh, like in the military, everything is like based off rank. So it's like how much you get paid. Uh, like your respect and all that, like you have to wear like a uniform, whereas you go to tech and it's just like, like you want to grind and move up, then, you know, do you. Like, you know, it's not like, oh, stay here for a couple of years and then like, you know, then we'll think about promoting you. It's like, oh, if you want to go hard, then go hard and you can move up as much as you want. Um, so it's just like, it's like night and day. Um, and then uh, the dynamic, I don't know how much everyone knows about the military, but you can't like, um, like for instance, you can't call anyone that outranks you by their first name. So, like, that's something, like, I was just used to for, like, six years, and then you get to, like, uh, Twitter, and then it's like, oh, I could call Chris, Chris, and um, Jack is, like, having lunch, and you could just say, what up, Jack, you know, and he's just like, hey, and it's just like, what? Like, you just say what's up to the CEO, and he wearing skinny jeans, and has a nose ring and stuff like that, so it's just, it's like a whole different world. <laughs> so, and then, Chris, what's your, I keep, I always forget, so, um, when you're an engineer, they have, like, two tracks, you could be, like, a uh, IC, which is uh, individual contributor, and uh, Chris, what's that one? I guess just EM. Yeah, like, manager. Yeah. Okay. So you could be an individual contributor, which means you could just move up through the ranks, and you never have to manage anybody. Even though I heard it's like weird cases where you do, or you could be like a, in management where you move up those ranks. But uh, Chris is a IC, and I think his level is like what is it like equal to a director or something like that. I, I can't remember. But anyways, I'm just saying like to be like that cool to call him Chris and then be in the military where it's like, like son, don't you ever address me on my first name? Like, it's just stuff like that that I appreciate. Like I can call people by their first names now. 
So uh, it's like little things like that. Uh, oh, we get food. We have breakfast and lunch every day. In the military, we, it was like you had to buy your own food, and it wasn't even good. Like you had to pay for it, and it wasn't good. But Twitter is free, and it's actually pretty good. If anybody's in the Bay Area, yeah, just come through for lunch. I love showing people like the HQ and letting them taste how good the food is, so it can motivate you that much more. Um, hey Jordan, uh, quick, quick, uh, let me intervene the real quick. I know you did <laughs> your second AMA. Um, with Career Karma, during your first one, you dropped like ranges in terms of obviously like the pay of what does an oh. engineer make at Twitter. You don't have to drop like the specific numbers, but just to give people an idea in terms of like what's possible if you're like getting your first foot through the door and like two, three, ten years down the line. Okay, so yeah, I usually refer people to Glassdoor for stuff like this, but uh, <laughs> let me see. So like when I was in the military, um, I had been in for about almost six years and I was a staff sergeant in um, Northern California. I probably made like, I wanna say like maybe 60,000 in the military. And that was like after putting in like five and a half years of work, like, hey, I'm, I got this right now, I get 60K. Um, and then like uh, when I got my internship, um, I wanna say my internship for me in the military was like a 20K raise. That's just being an intern though. Like, so it was, it was like 80,000 being like an intern. Um, and then, um, going full time for my military pay, like it more than doubled. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, more, more than 120, like, uh, like salary. So, and that's just like, that's entry level too. Like you're talking about like kids this coming like straight out of college, so they're making like, you know, 130 or something crazy. And then you talking about 10 years, I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm still wondering, I'm still figuring out how to ask Chris that question. <laughs> what can I expect 10 uh, years down the line, Chris? Uh, I don't know. But so, yeah, I mean, out here, I feel like most companies, like the, I feel like the entry level is probably like 125 to 135, maybe like for your, uh, for junior. So I mean, at least like from some of my friends that I talk to that are just getting like their jobs for the first time. So I know someone that works at he just got a job at Redfin. Uh, they started him at like 125. Um, Brandon, Brandon, who should be on this call, he just started at Walmart. Uh, I think he's like 129 or something. And it's like all like the Bay Area companies. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's pretty standard. Yeah. I don't know about ten years down the line. Yeah, yeah. No, that's. I think that gives people an idea. Obviously, you're in the Bay Area, and the cost of living is a lot higher than other areas. But the reason I'm asking, I ask you this, is um, there's a lot of opportunity for growth for people who just want to hustle and work hard and put in the work. And then you also get a skill set that then gives you leverage to not just work for a big company, you can work for a small company, you can do what my co-founders and I did and start your own company. And so you get a lot of opportunities in life to take control of your destiny and your career. Uh, I think we're, we're getting to the 5.30 mark, and so we have about 25 minutes left. So I wanna open it up for Career Karma members to ask uh, Chris and Jordan, ask you questions. Um, if you're gonna be asking a question, maybe you can... Uh, so Mark, before he does, before you open up to the floor, could Chris answer Ruben's second question? Oh, the 10 years? Yeah, I, I want to hear the answer to that too. Yeah. Well, well, that one and uh, how his journey from being like uh, a beginner, be, you know, mm -hmm. engineering to where he's at now, like a different. I'll, uh, I'll try to be quick. So uh, I didn't study computer science. I did go to college, but I did not study computer science in college. Uh, I actually studied uh, astrophysics and I have a second degree in art. I painted. Um, <laughs> I went to college, I'm from Louisiana, I went to college in Texas, and uh, I thought I was going to go to grad school in physics, I decided not to do that, and uh, talked my way into a programming job in San Francisco, I had them move me out from, from Texas to San Francisco, and um, I've been doing programming ever since, but I, I basically taught myself everything as I went along, and just kept talking my way through jobs, to, 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 and kept learning. Um, in this, one of the reasons I like programming is because you're constantly learning. Um, when I started at Twitter, the language that I work in right now, the computer language, the programming language I work in right now, I did not know. I learned it here at Twitter, and I ended up writing a framework in that language that most of the company uses now. But I had to teach myself that language with help from everybody else in the company. But you're constantly learning, and you're constantly reinventing yourself. And that's one of the things that I like about this is that it never gets stale. It, it never really gets old. You see a lot of the same sort of patterns, but um, you, you sort of learn uh, new things kind of all the time and you're constantly sort of reinventing and, and keeping up with what's going on. 
Um, when I was younger, I worked a lot in the front end. I did a lot of JavaScript stuff, did a lot of HTML stuff, much like Jordan did as well. I eventually moved because I, I didn't like people arguing over the color of buttons um, into the back end where it was a lot more stable. Um, and so I, I ended up uh, working mostly in Java. I came into Twitter where we work mostly in Scala. It's also a JVM based language, so having a Java understanding helps, but I did not know the particulars of Scala and it took me a while to learn them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that answered all the questions. My first computer science language was actually basic that I learned in high school and then I did Pascal for a little while, but that's about it. And Jordan's question, your 10 year mark. <laughs> about, uh, what was the question specifically? I think it was about what compensation is, ranges. What is, oh, what is uh, that our future senior engineers expect to make at that 10 year mark where you're at? I think we have to do a whole AMA on compensation because of the fact that you have to count, you have to count uh, like liquidity and stock and things like that. And that gets into a whole different thing, right? So right, right now when my manager looks at me, they look at my total compensation, which is not just my salary, it's also any stock options that I have, my vesting period, how much of that is hitting this year. And they play that out and project it over time. And they want to make sure that I am competitive or that they're paying me competitively against other companies. Otherwise, other companies would probably poach me. Right? So if they're not paying me a total compensation, which is actual salary and stock that's vesting at a certain amount of price, um, they're, they're going to probably, they're going to, they're going to try to fix that. And so I have those conversations uh, once a year with my manager on where we are with my compensation. Everybody has that, com has that conversation because it's a year over year thing um, where you get your review, you have a compensation change, keep up with cost of living, um, any effects from promotions, things like that. But um, where I am right now, I can definitely say that it's the most money I've paid in my life. And hopefully that continues every year. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for being so transparent, uh, Chris, Jordan. Let's open it up for our community. Um, if people can just introduce themselves first and then ask the question, that would be great. Short intros. Right. Hi, uh, Chris, how's it going? I'm, I'm so sorry, bro. Um, Go ahead, brother. Um, my name is Chris Warren and I'm a, I'm actually a, a mobile, mobile app development for Android. Um, and what is, what is the difference and how do you, how does the team interview work between a, uh, the differences between a mobile developer like myself or like a, a web developer? And, and can you, can you go into some of the detail about the differences in, in how the hiring process goes with that? Yeah, I can, a, a little bit. So all of our engineering, um, whether or not you're in uh, web, mobile, backend, um, all of our engineering interviews are structured very similarly. Um, though they usually ask a general sort of coding question um, that is apropos to that area. And then they'll ask a domain specific. So if you're doing uh, mobile and you're primarily Android, they'll ask you a sort of Android coding question, something that's probably Java based. Otherwise, if you're iOS, they'll do something that's iOS based. And then they'll, again, we'll do a behavior interview. Um, but they try to ask sort of general uh, coding problem, coding question, get a sense of like your general thought process. They'll try to ask something domain specific to the area that you're applying to or that you are going into or want to be into. And then they'll ask something, they'll ask a sort of behavioral interview to get a sense of you as a person. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. Just wanted to jump in um, really quick. Um, my name is Sleese. I'm also here at Twitter Recruiting. Um, and I just wanted to go back to the question of recruiting at Twitter. Um, someone said in the chat, do we look at LinkedIn? Ruben, you asked, is everyone on Twitter? Um, and I'll second that and say, is everyone on LinkedIn? Um, because our team, that is the first place that we're going. Um, and it's really how you're selling yourself. So um, make sure that you're on, on, on the platform, um, that everything is you know, really thought out in terms of your experience. Um, there's a formula that you know, we like to preach here in terms of what we're looking for. No matter where you're at, the projects, we want ownership, we want impact. Um, and what you're getting out of it. Um, and so make sure that you're connecting those dots together so um, that when we're looking on that, on you, at your experience, we can, we can really see um, the full breadth of what you're doing. Um, second to that, be visible. Um, follow our BRGs on Twitter. We're some of the most public BRGs out there. Um, engage with them, tweet at them. 
um, attend our events, um, reach out to folks that you connect with, really build those networks um, because there's three avenues that you, that you get an interview wherever you're at, right? You apply, you're referred, or, or someone reaches out to you. So just be cognizant of that um, as, as you're on your job search, but also as you're um, developing that experience, keep those, keep those things in mind. Thank you for sharing that, Luis. And for everybody that's going to continue to ask questions, recognize how special this is. You got somebody that went through the intern program that's working as an engineer for over a year that like followed a not background. You got a senior engineer with 20 years of engineering experience and a recruiter. That's heavy right there. So take advantage of this moment. All right. I can't um, tell. Oh, who was that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 you go, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so my name is Alvin, and um, what should you completely avoid doing during the interview that would have the most negative impact on landing a job? Uh, I could try to take that. Um, being silent. <laughs> like, when you, uh, when you get asked um, uh, a coding question or any type of question, um, the, so it's a two-way street, right? The, the interviewer is trying to understand you as a person and trying to understand your thought process. And ideally, you are getting a sense of what it's like to work with that person as well, right? And so it should hopefully flow as a conversation. It shouldn't feel, you shouldn't feel uh, strained. If you don't like who you're talking to, you probably won't like working with them either. And so the interview is as much for you as it is for them. But one of the biggest things that can happen is that you can freeze up, uh, you can go silent, and that sort of kills the interview um, because the interviewer is trying to coax information out of you. And if they can't get that information, it's kind of hard for them to evaluate you, unfortunately, as a, as a, as a candidate. And so they will have nothing really to be able to like, write about, to judge you on, to really sort of go back and say, like, we should definitely hire this person if you, if you don't end up talking. Um, it's unfortunate, especially if you, I don't like communicating with people all the time. I'm better in one on ones than I am in large groups, but, and it is challenging. And so it's one of the things I have to always build up when I'm going on an interview, especially with people I don't know, but it's like, I want the job. So I'm going to, I'm going to represent, I'm going to do what I need to do to get the job. So I'm going to, I'm going to get over that fear and I'm going to talk. But one of the best things you can do is always explain your thought process. Even if you don't know the answer to something, you don't know what it is. Just be like, talk out loud what you're thinking through it. Just kind of try to try to communicate your thought process as much as possible to give that person you're talking to um, a, a, an insight into how you're thinking about something. Yeah, okay. and I want to add. I want to add that it's never just about getting the right answer. The, the the reason they're asking you a problem is not to see if you can just write the right answer on the board. They want to see your thought process, and that's why even if you don't know something, just break down problems into smaller pieces, different attack it from different sides ask a lot of questions and uh, just remember that like they, they want to see what you're thinking, not what you like, if you can memorize the right answer. So always communicate. Definitely ask questions. That's it. That's, it. That's also a big one. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, my name is Diarte. Um, I am, I'm pretty much, you know, starting out and everything. And um, pretty, uh, pretty much my question is, for those that are like me, um, pretty much my, a part of my degree program and everything involve, revolves around social media. So um, for me, it's just like, you know, this is kind of in the sector of where my career was heading all along. Um, my question is, with the skills that I'm learning now, um, you know, learning coding and everything. Eventually, if, you know, let's say I were to get a job at Twitter or whatnot, is there room for like cross training and everything to where I'm able to kind of learn various sectors of the, you know, of the platform and of the company while also working, you know, in the, in the, in the engineering position that, you know, of that I get hired for per se. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, yes. So one of the, the good things here is that, uh, again, it's, it's relatively small. Engineering is relatively small. So you will see a lot of different things. Um, you have the opportunity. One of the things I like about being here is that you really have the opportunity to control your own destiny. You can make your own way. Um, you can sort of uh, push to work on 
um, what you're interested in uh, within sort of the larger context of whatever your group is doing. But you can also move around. We encourage people to find what they want to do and enjoy. You, you should want to come to work. Again, it's not the military. Uh, you're not forced to be here. You're making a choice to be here, and so we want people to make that choice based on things that they want to do, um, which helps them be productive. Um, the, I'm on my third team since being at Twitter. Uh, I've moved around, tried to find a niche um, that, I, that I enjoy being in. I enjoy the people I work with right now, and I enjoy the problem space that I'm in. But one of the other things that's available here is that we do a lot of learning. We have a, a whole group dedicated to teaching classes. Um, and other uh, engineers can teach classes as well. Some of my team teaches classes about the stuff that we work on, but there's a whole Twitter university group that's responsible for putting on classes, helping socialize things to learn about, and there's lots of different random things that you can go. If you wanna get interested in data science or machine learning, there's usually a class on machine learning taught by people who are doing data science and machine learning. Um, you, you can go, go to the class, listen to it, talk to it. If it sounds really interesting, if you like working with those people, if you think that's cool, you can try to say, hey, you guys have an opening in your team for somebody who wants to learn this stuff or be on this. Um, uh, there's a lot of ways to move around. And, and most companies will usually make it easy to, to move around because they want you to stay there. Um, once you're invested, once you're there and, and an employee, it's much harder to replace you. So they want you to stay and be a, a productive, happy employee. And so they usually make it easy to move around. If they don't, that's a shame because you most likely will leave the company in order to find what you're trying to find. But we, we definitely make that easier here. That's pretty much the position I'm in right now. <laughs> I had a question. Uh, my question is, um, I'm Elliot Sanford. I'm a, a heavy Twitter user. You can find me at Techie Elliot. But uh, my, my question is just related to Twitter, the platform. How is it that Twitter has become such a platform uh, that developers use it more than Facebook, more than Instagram, more than uh, even LinkedIn is kind of seen as more of uh, the link, like uh, less than, you know, in terms of a professional developer uh, network. Uh, what is it that, that Twitter is doing to, to keep that status and how did they kind of attain that in your eyes? I can take a stab at this. Um, someone once described it to me. I, I'm actually not on Facebook, so uh, I can't I can't really verify this. But um, someone once told me that Facebook is everyone you went to high school with, and that Twitter is everyone you wish you went to high school with, and that's sort of the difference. Um, Twitter is much more open, right? It's a, it's it's public, right? It's you're following other people who are publicly available who are tweeting their 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 thoughts and their ideas into the sphere. And it is not necessarily a closed sort of social network that, um, that Facebook is. Um, again, I'm not on Facebook. I don't really know how it works. This is just my, my interpretation. I think people value that openness, though, that people value that open communication. We definitely value that here um, as, as one of the tenets of the platform. And we believe that being able to sort of have free and open communication um, enables people to find each other, enables people to find other communities and other people who are like them to be able to share those ideas and be able to find the networking um, and be able to find jobs. I know several people who are here who found their job through Twitter, um, people who find other jobs through Twitter. It's, a, it's just a, a much more open communication environment than, than, than Facebook. I had a question. Uh, if somebody's uh, coming out of boot camp, uh, what particularly are you looking for, like on LinkedIn, if uh, Louise is still here, or uh, just in the interview in particular, other than like what the coding part? So on, on LinkedIn, what we're looking for is, are you engaged in the community, right? So it's not just your LinkedIn itself, but you know, everyone can go on GitHub, everyone can be, you know, contributing to other repositories, really building that knowledge set and also just being involved blogging, following the right, you know, the right users, being really a subject matter expert in your, in, in whatever it is that you're, you're specializing in um, is ultimately important. And you don't need to go to a CS, you know, you don't need a CS degree. You, you know, it, it really is that internal motivation um, and building that brand for yourself. Um, so can, 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 can I say something about that? So like, if you all are, if you are documenting your journey and writing different posts for the career comic blog or whatever, and you want to share that, you can like start posting that on your LinkedIn to continue to build your personal brand so that people like Luis can notice 
what you're writing about and you, the documentation of your story. Because at the end of the day, if everybody has the same skill set, they're looking for other things that make you different, that would add value, and that would enrich the culture of Twitter. Right? Am I accurate, Luis? Perfectly said, brother. Thank you. I, I have a question. So you you know how uh, at the job description the right um, the one of the requirements is uh, oh, five years experience. What if uh, I just graduated from a, a twelve month boot camp? Uh, how how does that apply to? How does that make me qualify for the job? A job that that requires me to have a five years experience of coding. How how does that make me uh, qualify for the job? Even though I just graduated from a boot camp of twelve months, do, like my question is, do I have a chance of landing the job? Uh, I, I can try to answer. Um, so you you probably have a better chance of uh, getting an internship first, um, and then converting from the internship to full time. And so I think in those cases trying to apply directly to a position that says requires five or X number of years experience will be harder um, unless you actually have an in with the hiring manager or the person you can talk to and get in front of them, right? It's like you can talk to your story and be like, look, I don't have those five years experience, but here's what I can do and here's what I bring to the table. It's hard to have that, to get to that conversation though because of the wall of um, sort of the internet in your way, but you most likely have a better shot of being able to get your foot in the door through an internship when you get an internship, you're in front of people, you're working with them every day for three months or plus, they see what you do. They see what you bring to the table, they see your personality, they understand what you are, and that moves you, that can move you ahead so much better than a blind resume can. And so I think focusing on uh, trying to get internships, if you can, and if you can, if you can do that, um, and you have that sort of time and, and, and you can deal with like not needing a job right now, that's the sort of way to, to sort of get in the door. Hey, this this kind of uh, brings us back to the back door, I guess. Uh, that's that's a good way to get in. <laughs> but uh, I mean, not just saying like go through the back door, but um, my daughter's running in again. But uh, Jordy, get close the door. <laughs> but just saying, like, if you want to get the job, you don't always have to just go through like the applying and stuff. Like, you could just. Uh, networking stuff. So when I first started like coding, I didn't know like anyone at a tech company at all. Like uh, not one person. Like I just pretty much said I was just like kind of working in the dark. Like I didn't know like anyone. I could be like, hey, give me a tour of Twitter. You know, like can I meet a hiring manager? I didn't know not one person. So uh, it was kind of just like grinding and just like every person I meet, just telling them like, hey, what I'm working on, um, and like what I'm interested in. And uh, that's literally how like I got introduced to Twitter. Like I was just talking to someone I work with. And I just told him, like, told him about Twitter and tech and stuff. And he's like, oh, I know somebody there. And it's like, oh, uh, he introduced me to this one person. And it was like, literally, like, that one person was able to make some things, like, happen for, like, one connection. And, uh, I mean, and it's like, when you do that and you're just talking and building your network, it's like, you can circumvent, like, a lot of stuff, uh, such as, like, having to rely on, like, falling into, like, a, like a recruiting funnel, which, I mean, it's not saying that you can ever do it, but it's like, you'll get, like, a... Uh, I mean, a better way into the company to where it's like, oh, you don't have to have five years if you like meet people and like uh, show them you're passionate like around that. So, uh, so I kind of like, so yeah, go through the back door. Yeah, I would also. Yeah, I, 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 I was just gonna say I never got a job through the website either. I like what Aaron said around like during a job you are the product. Selling yourself is huge because employers tend to overlook experience if you know how to do the work. Um, you know, LinkedIn profiles are important. Um, GitHub profiles are important. The projects that you built are important. The projects that are aligned with who you are as a person are important. And the story that you tell in that regard is super important. And so, like, um, you know, just don't – the boot camp is a tool. Um, a lot of times these job descriptions are kind of like an initial filter for what they think is what they're looking for. But at the end of the day, if you can do the work, that's what matters. And, and people like working with you, that's what matters. Yeah, and I would add um... – what Luis said, there's three ways of, remember that there's three ways of um, getting, three ways of getting a job at a company, right? The easiest way for you to get a job um, is obviously when a, when a company reaches out to you, which kind of implies that you probably have some, you probably have experience and that's why the company is reaching out to you. The other two ways is either you apply on the website 
which is the easiest thing to do if you're the one applying. And then the other, the, the third option is doing it through a referral. If you go the route of applying online, right, through a job description, there's hundreds of people applying through the same job description, and then it's hard for you to stand out and to share your story because you're just another resume, right? And But if you reach out to a decision maker, right, someone who works at the company, someone who understands your passion, your drive, your story, then it becomes easier because you're bypassing a number of steps and you're creating your own luck and your own destiny, very similar to how Jordan did it. So um, just keep that in mind. And I always say this, that there's going to be large companies, there's going to be small startups, uh, but you only need one company to give you a job, right? There's thousands of companies out there and you need just one. So as long as you keep going and applying yourself, there's going to be nobody to tell you whether or not you're going to be an engineer um, after you graduate from a coding boot camp. Before wrapping up, I agree with all of that. Um, how many people finish the 21 day challenge and have a career karma shirt? Protect your dream shirt. Okay. I do. I definitely do. I wear mine. I'm I know I do. But I'm waiting I'm, for I'm my waiting shirt. on my shirt. I'm waiting on my shirt. I'm waiting on my shirt. I'm waiting on my shirt. Are you damn to send me my shirt? Yeah. Beautiful. The shirts that are, the shirts for the people that finished the shirts on the way, you. people that got them, they excited. You see their hype. That, that, that protect your dreams thing actually came from Jordan. So real quick, Jordan, can you tell the people what the shirt is? <laughs> can you tell the people? When did we get the shirt? Ruby, you muted yourself, but I'm guessing you said tell the story about how I came up with the shirt. So I'm just going to tell the story. Yeah. Uh, so pretty much uh, when I was in the Air Force, I was learning how to code. And like I said, I didn't have like any kind of like technical uh, or any kind of network in tech at all. So whenever like I did meet someone that was like even remotely like close to tech, I would be like, oh, you know, like tell me more about yourself. Uh, so um, pretty much I'm working at my job in the Air Force and I had like a job where I like sat at like a front, like kind of like a service desk where people come up and ask me for stuff and I go do it and stuff, uh, which is actually how I met the, the guy that introduced me to Twitter. But uh, it was one day I was talking to this pilot and uh, he was just talking about how he had to go like drive like I don't know like a hundred miles home or something I was like, oh, where do you live? So I was like if it's a hundred miles like from where I was at the moment I was like hundred miles. That's like Silicon Valley like I was like, oh this dude must he must live uh, in uh, SV so I'm like and yeah, I think he lived in like Sunnyvale or something. I was like, oh, like who are you dude? Why do you live in Sunnyvale? And he was like an operations manager at Facebook. So I was like, oh yeah, uh, operations manager at Facebook. Like I'm in there, so <laughs> so like I like get this dude contact info, and I'm like hitting him up, like while I'm like uh, like learning like how to code and stuff, and like asking him like how how can I get into like Facebook, you know, be an engineer. And so like I'm like talking to this dude, and he's just like he's like telling me stuff like, hey, don't try to be an engineer and stuff like this. And I'm just like I'm like what, you know, like this is what I like to do. Like I'm coding, like you know, like I don't want to do something else. And he's like he's like oh maybe you should be like you should try to be like a recruiter or something. And I'm just like. Like, you know, like, I've already been in the Air Force doing, like, this one job that I don't like. Like, when I came to the Air Force, they just, like, slapped the helmet on you and be like, hey, go do that. So, uh, I'm like, you want me to go do, like, another job that, like, I don't want to do? Like, I, I'm telling you what I want to do. And he's like, oh, it's going to be too hard. You got to compete with people from uh, from Google, Apple, like, all the other crazy companies, you know, which is true. Like, we all going to have to compete with them because they're, like, moving around trying to get jobs, too. So like yeah, he just keeps saying like just try to be like a like a recruiter or something, and then you know maybe one day you could switch over. And I'm just like man, this dude like he just trying to like chop me down before I get started. And uh, so that was kind of like where I just kind of randomly said like you got to protect your dreams out here because like uh, I mean at this point when I was talking to this dude like I was already like like I was already solid up here like yo you can't tell me nothing like all right uh, this dude don't believe he getting xed out like so I'm pretty sure like I just stopped talking to this dude like all right he's he's not the one. Um, so that's where I came up with protect your dreams. Cause I mean, like if I would have listened to him, like, Oh, he's right. Don't be an engineer. You got too much competition. Like, you know, like you never going to make it past like all these people coming from uh, Google and uh, Twitter and Apple and stuff. Then I would have stopped and went in a different direction. And then like, like right now where I am, this wouldn't exist anymore. If I would have listened to this one dude. So that's where I came up with, with the protect your dreams thing where it's just like, like you just got to kind of like bet on yourself. Cause I mean, this dude, he could have messed all this up, you know, like <laughs> just off that one like little phone call. So, uh, or phone call, text, whatever it was. So that's where I came up with that. Oh, also, Ruben, I found out I'm not the person that made that up. I was watching Pursuit of Happiness and he said that. 
So yeah, that must be because they're locked. Protected. You're right. You're right. <laughs> yeah, he's saying different version. But so you know, thank you for sharing that. I, I I gotta hop to the next call. I was just gonna say like, any, any anybody that has more questions for me, you can send me a message. But make sure you all tweet at Chris, at Jordan, at Luis. How much you appreciate this call? Um, use the hashtag. Use the protect your dreams phrase. Um, don't quit. Stay focused, and I'll see you guys next time. All right. Peace. So let's. Uh, so we're about to wrap up. Uh, we 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 have room for one more question. Anyone want to jump in? Uh, ask Jordan or Chris one last question. I do. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you first. Lauren, go I, ahead. Well, Jordan, I had a question for you. Uh, according to the uh, jobs at Twitter, do they have um, any jobs as far as software? jobs for um, cybersecurity, and do they link up to DevOps, or do you know? Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds more like a, a question for Chris. <laughs> 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 do you have, uh, do you have we roles? definitely have jobs in cybersecurity. Um, there's a whole group. Um, linking up with DevOps, we do SREs. Uh, there is a, um, the security team is organized in, in different ways, and I don't fully understand your organization, but there is an arm of that organization that does a uh, that does operations and coding. Um, okay. But obviously, there they do lots of different things from all the way from uh, the data center security, sort of physical security, all the way to cybersecurity stuff, and that's all under the same security organization. So um, it kind of kind of runs the gambit, but there's definitely a tie-in to not only operations, DevOps, SRE, but also uh, code as well. Okay, I don't know a whole lot about DevOps, but I kind of really am looking into like learning a little bit more about it, but I love cybersecurity because that's my background is security and um, corrections. So I'm kind of like, you know, learning a little bit more about it and everything like that. And as far as Jordan goes, as far as the writing the book, he spoke it into existence, so I think you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Chris, yeah. I think I should we do all it. think Jordan should do it. Wait, do what? I missed it. Write a book. Write, write a book. book. Write a book. Oh yeah, I wrote a blog post. It's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, drop the drop the blog post link in the chat too. Uh, hey, you should write a book. If you need a publisher, I have one. A book though? <laughs> Wait, I, don't know. I don't know if I did anything enough to warrant a book yet. <laughs> Maybe, uh, all right, all right, you can be my publisher. Let me try to find this uh, article real quick. Hey, Chris. Yeah, Thomas. Thomas. I want to ask, um, I want to ask a question. Uh, I'm in software development at Flatiron right now, and I'm doing, um, I'm doing Ruby fundamentals, and I'm doing software development, and I want to know, can I get a job in software development after I finish graduation from Flatiron? Could I also have uh, experience doing Python and HTML and CSS and all those other languages at the same time? And I would like to get my foot in the door at Twitter if I can, because I've already gotten a uh, possibility at Microsoft and PlayStation as well. Nice. Um, so most of our stuff is moved off of Ruby. Uh, we do have a lot of Python, but it's mostly for scripting and not our front end. The front-end stuff is mostly, uh, well, it's moving to React, a lot of JavaScript, HTML. Uh, back-end is all JVM, some Java, uh, Scala, some C in some places. But um, you can definitely apply, try to get an internship even if you want. Um, there's the web team is split up into sort of multiple different areas because uh, there's like mobile web, there's regular desktop web. Um, there's like a couple of special webs for low connectivity, um, to, uh, other countries, um, sort of low bandwidth. Uh, and then there's obviously all of the mobile app development as well for both iOS and Android and even iPad. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities and I, I think you could do it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And w one last question before we wrap up. And I always ask, I always ask about the imposter syndrome. Um, Jordan, I remember last year when you were coming around our Friday office hours before you got, you had your internship, but before you got your full-time offer. And I know we had a lot of discussions about like, like your future and all those things. I, I would love for Jordan and Chris 
for you guys to talk about the imposter syndrome, if you face it, if you do, then how do you deal with it? How, what advice do you have for people in career karma? Oh man, this is like, this is like a crowd favorite, isn't it? <laughs> imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome, it's just like, I don't know. I kind of summed it up as when you know you have to do like a big project and you kind of like thinking about the end state, but it's like, like a hundred steps in between. You just like, man, how am I ever going to do like these hundred steps? So that's kind of like how imposter syndrome gets me. But uh, I feel like just knowing, like being confident in yourself that you're going to like figure out the solution. Like that sounds kind of like cliche, but it's, that's just what it is. You like get freaked out because you think you're not going to figure it out, but you usually always do figure it out. Um, and then uh, just talking to more senior engineers too is really helpful. Like when I like started talking like to Chris when I was on his team and he was mentoring me, and then Chris is like, yeah, I get imposter syndrome too. And like Chris is like one step away from being like the most senior you could be at Twitter, like as an engineer. Like he has one more step and he even gets imposter syndrome. It feels like like he, he doesn't, I don't know how. I'm just like, really, Chris? Like you, you bullshit me, right? But uh, <laughs> even he gets it. So it's just like, once you hear stuff like that, it's like, oh, like, hey, this is normal. Like, we all get imposter syndrome. So, um, so yeah, it's just being like confident. Like, like if you got this far, like learning how to code and you got stuck and then you got unstuck, whether if it feels with Google or someone helping you, if you got unstuck, then you just got to be confident in yourself to do it. Because, I mean, I forget stuff like all the time. Like everyone here is probably like learning JavaScript, right? Like I, like sometimes I have to Google how to like console log a statement in JavaScript. Like I'm a professional engineer now. And sometimes I can't even like log stuff to the console. I'm like, got to go on Google. Like how do I log something to the console? Like, and, uh, or if I'm working in Scala, I'll be like trying to do console log in Scala. Like, and I'm just like, what, how you, how do you log stuff to the console in Scala? Like, so it's just, it's like little dumb stuff like that that you, you like don't have to know all the time. As long as you could figure it out, like with Google, a book, whatever, like you good. So turn it over to Chris, see what he has to say about this. <laughs> uh, imposter syndrome is really um, when you feel like you don't belong, but it really means that you're underselling the work and the value that you've put in. And uh, what I try to always remember is that where you come from does not define where you can go. And I didn't study computer science. Um, I, didn't, I didn't learn this stuff in college. I didn't, I didn't teach myself much like Jordan did, but I worked at it and no one's gonna take away the work that I did. No one can take away the work that I did um, and what I've learned. So that is what I try to hold on to when I feel like, as Jordan said, there's a million steps to get to that answer. And I feel like I'm never going to get there, that I don't belong, that I, if someone else should probably be doing this. Um, I felt like I was really bad at math in college and in high school even. But uh, I just keep focusing on it and keep trying to push forward. And I know at the end of the day, and as I've gotten older now, I realize that, um, that light at the end of the tunnel, I always seem to get there somehow. And I just keep relying on the fact that I've gotten there before. I'm going to get there again. I think that's a great way for us to end. Um, thank you so much, Chris, Jordan, for tuning in, for joining, sharing your stories. Um, I know Chris and Jordan shared their Twitters in the chat. So afterwards, definitely tweet at them, follow them. I'm sure they have a lot of uh, blogs and other stuff that they share on their Twitter feeds. And I just want to remind everyone in Career Karma, like Jordan said, uh, protect your dreams. Uh, you, the biggest bet you're taking is on yourself. Uh, you just need one company to get you a job, to get your career started. So keep hustling, keep reaching out to people, reach out to, follow Luis, Chris, Jordan on Twitter, start building these relationships now. And in six, 12 months, you're gonna have already more people in tech than you have now, if you just keep reaching out to every guest that comes along. So great, great night. Thanks again to Luis. Um, Jordan and Chris and let's break in everyone. Good night. Thank let's you. give them a round of applause. Woo! Let's give uh, Chris, Jordan, Luis a round of applause. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good night everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Oh. Good night everyone. How do you hang up this thing?